want to make sure that everyone understands there's a difference between the economy and the stock market. They're not the same thing. So when people look at the state of affairs today and they say, you know, the economy's in bad shape, which I don't disagree with, it's not the same thing as the stock market. The economy is measured by gross domestic product. And you see, it was just announced we had a positive gross domestic product, and everyone basically said, yeah, but we're still going down. Well, gross domestic product measures all the economic activity in the country during that time period. About 40 to 50% of that economic activity is small business, the lifeblood of America. However, all the economic activity in small business doesn't really affect the stock market. Stock market by nature is not small business and it reflects the value of a company on any given day. And so those of you who are small business owners will know your business goes up, your business goes down. It's just the way it goes. It's the same thing. I tell people to think about your house. For most people, your house is your single largest investment you'll ever make. But no one looks at what happened to it over the last week, two weeks, last day, a month, because basically your value is going up and down all the time. But you don't see it. It's not valued. So it really doesn't affect you. And what you ultimately say is, I still own the house. It's the same thing with an investment. If you invested in Apple shares and it's down, you still own the same shares. And one thing is true with market downturns, and this is 100% of the case. Whenever there's been a market downturn, the market has recovered. And one thing that ruins investors is they let fear or greed dictate their investment decisions. And you can't afford to do that. Fear and greed are probably the two investment emotions that will kill you. Fear is people sell out when they shouldn't. Perfect example, let's go back to 2020. 2020, the market was down about 25% as the economy shut down because of COVID. People panicked, people sold out. By the end of the year, the market had a positive return. And by the way, that's an example where the economy didn't improve, the stock market did. The economy operates sometimes differently than the, the stock market. So the bottom line is when we, we talk about investing, we want to make sure that you're going to be successful. And to be successful, you have to be dispassionate. You can't let emotions dictate your decisions. If you go back to 2006, 2007, people thought you could never lose money on real estate. And people were putting money into their houses because they're always going to get it out. Well, then we had the real estate crash in 2008, the Great Recession. People found out that uh, um, the risk there. And people, you know, you cannot get caught up in, you know, jumping on the bandwagon where you're letting your emotions dictate. I think you're always should be dispassionate and invest not what's happening in the market, but invest on the most important thing that there is. And the most important thing there is, is setting your goals. That's how you really determine how you invest your money. It's goals and objectives. That is what determines it. And when I talk about goals and objectives, think about planning a vacation. So when I plan a vacation, what I don't do is I don't pack first and then decide where I want to go. What I do is I decide where I want to go. I decide how long I'm going for. And then I make the decision how to pack. 
The issue isn't, should I take my golf clubs or not on vacation? The issue is where I'm going, should I take my golf clubs? And I bring that up because when people say, should I buy this investment or should I buy that investment? I don't know. Because unless you tell me what your goal is, then I don't know. Someone today bought Apple stock and someone sold Apple stock today. They each could have made the right financial move for themselves. It's goals and objectives that determines it. And always think about that vacation. You don't pack first. Think of your clothes like your investments, stocks and bonds. That is the last phase. The most important phase is decide where you are going and how long you're going to be there. That's important. So when it comes time to talk about your goals and objectives when it comes to investing, think about this. Are you saving it for your retirement, which is 20, 30 years down the road or maybe 10 years down the road? Are you saving for a new house that you want to buy a year or two from now? Do you have college for the kids or the grandkids that may be coming up? That's how you invest based upon those goals. So a portfolio that is geared for retirement, which is 20 years down the road, may look totally different than a portfolio for a new home, which is a year down the road. Goals and objectives. And I know it's difficult to do. If it was easy, everyone would do it. It's not easy. It's difficult to think about it. But that's what you have to do. Now, you may have 10 goals, but realistically, you should narrow them down into, you know, three different areas. Which one of your goals are long term, which means maybe, you know, seven to 10 years plus down the road? What's, you know, midterm, something that's three to five, three to seven years down the road or something short term? one or two years down the road. Because that's going to help you decide how you're investing your money. Think about this. You can't pack for a vacation unless you know where you are going. If Troy Library said, look, at, we're so appreciative of everyone coming here today. Everyone gets a free vacation. Go home and pack and come back. We're going. Well, we'd have a lot of questions. Where are we going? So we know how to pack, how long we're going for, so we know what to, uh, you know, how much to bring. All that stuff's important. And it is important, too, when you are an investor. Focus on what you're trying to achieve and the time frame you have to achieve it. If I said to you, you know, you've been investing in an S&P 500 fund for the last 10 years, you know, you average between 10 and 11 percent a year. You're going to say that's great. However, if your goal was long term, on the other hand, if your goal was one year down the road and you invested in an S&P 500 a year ago, you're down 16%. That's not so good. And it's not that the S&P is not a good, a good investment. It's not a good investment for that goal. It is goals and objectives that determine how you invest money. There's another concept to understand about investing. And for as long as I've been in the investment world, people will say to me, Rick, I want to invest risk-free. I don't want to take any risk. So let me tell you, there is no such thing. It doesn't exist. I wish I could tell you what a risk-free investment is. Now, I do when I'm talking to younger people, you know, high school students or college kids, I always tell them investing in a good education always pays off. That's always a good investment. But when it comes to the real world, there's no investment that doesn't have risk. And what we need to do as investors is to identify the risk. I know there are investments out there that the salespeople push risk, that there's no risk. 
and 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 they get away with it because if you invest fifty thousand, they tell you at the end of the time period, it could be twenty years down the road, that you're going to at least get that fifty thousand dollars back. So there's no risk. Well, that sounds pretty good. You can't lose money. However, we live in the real world. Fifty thousand dollars twenty years ago does not have the purchasing power that $50,000 has today. So your money has eroded. You're not getting it back. You and I have to recognize, we all know the risk of the stock market. Stock market goes up, stock market goes down any given day, any given year. So that's market risk investment. But there's also something called purchasing power risk. Your money's not keeping up with the increased cost of living. So inflation right now is running 8% a year. So your money's eroded in value. You, to, if you invest in something like a CD, because you think, you know, I just don't want to take risk, you have to accept you are accepting a risk. And that risk is your money is going to erode in value. Now, in the old days, they would tell retirees, someone getting ready to retire, they're, you know, 65, so they were old. You know, that's a good move. Put your money in CDs and, you know, no problem. Well, it really wasn't a problem because the goal then was to say, maybe you get five years in retirement. You retired 65, you're going to be dead at 70. Well, fast forward to today's world, where someone who's 65 can be around easily another 20, 30 years from now, and they're not going to sit home and watch Oprah all day. They're going to be out traveling. They're going to be out doing things. And their cost of living is going to go up. And especially when you talk over a 20, 25, 30-year period, not keeping up with the increased cost of living is going to erode your money. There's a reason why so many people in their 80s are running out of money. Because they didn't take into consideration purchasing power risks. So, people say to me, well, Rick, you know, there's no risk on a CD. Well, there again, purchasing power risk. If you invest in a CD, even today, you're getting 4%. Inflation's at 8%. Remember that 4% you're paying taxes on. So you're probably down to 3% and inflation's at 8%. Now, that, that doesn't mean I don't tell people not to invest in CDs because I think CDs are good in certain time situations. If someone tells me that they're buying a new house in a year and they need to protect this money, I'm saying buy a one-year CD because you're not taking market risk. And over any given year, yes, it's not keeping up with inflation, but at least we're getting, you know, a, a decent rate of return and we're not taking market risks. You got to be invested longer term to take market risks. So always remember this when we talk about investing. There's no such thing as risk-free investing. It just doesn't exist. And certainly I would tell anyone, if you think of an investment you think is risk-free, you know, put it in the chat. I'd, I'd love to hear it because there isn't. And you know what's funny? Over the years, I can tell you what, you know, at different seminars, what people have told me is risk-free. I remember once, and I think this was back in the late 80s or early 90s, Someone at one of the seminars was telling me that he thought Beanie Babies, you remember those, was a risk-free investment because how well they were doing. It sort of reminds me for that there were baseball cards. And, you know, not too long ago, people were talking you can't lose money on Bitcoins. Well, Bitcoins, which a while ago were selling for over $60,000 a coin, are now about $20,000 a coin. So everything has risk. And what we want to do as investors is to understand and manage risk. We don't want all our investments with the same risk. 
we want to spread risk out over different, you know, different types of investments. And again, risk is a function of time. If someone says to me, is the stock market risky? And they tell me they want to invest for 15 years. I say you can pick any 15-year period in history. The market's never gone down. It's always going up. On the other hand, if they so I tell them that's not a very risky investment. On the other hand, if they told me they're investing for a year, I say the stock market is very, very aggressive. That's why it's important to know your time frame. Time frame dictates. Now, let me tell you this. You know what a lot of people in the investment world do, how they come up with portfolios for you? It's based upon your age. And what one of the popular formula is you take your age and subtract 100. So if someone was 65, you subtract 100, it's 35%. That means you should have 35% in the stock market and the rest in the bond market. I think those type of you know, portfolio construction aren't worth the paper they're written on. They say nothing about you. Nothing about what your goals and objectives are. Nothing about what your risk levels are. It categorizes people based upon age, and age doesn't tell you at all how you invest your money. There are people that are in their 70s, and their money is invested long term because they don't have any need for it now. They may, may be saving for their grandchildren's college education. On the other hand, someone may be in their early 60s and needs income to supplement their retirement because they don't have a pension. Don't invest based upon your age because your age doesn't tell you anything. It's goals and objectives that tell you how to invest your money and risk that you want to take. Now, I believe when it comes to investing, you have to set some rules for yourself. And the reason I say that is there's no one that's going to protect you like yourself. There are a lot of people in the investment world that can care less about you. They wear suits and ties. They look sharp. But I'll remind you that Bernie Madoff, you know, was a sophisticated looking guy. So I think you have to set some rules to yourself to protect yourself. And when these are the rules that I live by, and my goal is I'm willing to give up something on the high end, not to get hit on the low end. So one. I never invest in anything that I can't check out independently. When I say I want to check out an investment independently, I want to go to two or three different sources. I don't believe what the fund company or the stock is saying about themselves. I want independent information. And in today's world, we're flooded with stuff. And sometimes it's hard to find independent information. I'll tell you one of the rules I live by, if I can't find any independent information about an investment, I'm walking away from it. I'm not investing in it. Now, it's different if I said I want to take a flyer. When I put $10 down on the blackjack table, I assume I'm going to lose that 10 bucks in one hand. I, I just, you know, it's money that, you know, is entertainment money. On the other hand, if I put $10 into an investment, I expect to make money on it. And I want to make sure when I invest, I'm doing my homework. And if I can't check something out independently, I walk away from it. It's not going to be in my retirement portfolio. It's not going to be invested in money that I need. Independent information is what you want to rely on. And look at, I don't have to tell you today how much partisan stuff is out there. We have elections coming up. So anything is so partisan, we want to look for something that is independent. At least two sources. Two, I don't want to invest in anything that doesn't have a track record. 
Now, this may not be politically correct to say in today's world, but I think the reason you invest money is to make money. That's why you invest money. So why shouldn't we look at how something is done over a period of time? I mean, I want to see a track record. I can't tell you how many things I've heard it's going to be the newest, the greatest thing since sliced spread. And before you know it, the company's out of business. So I look at track records. And typically, if I'm investing in a mutual fund, which is the investment vehicle I recommend for most people, is I'm looking at three, five, and 10-year track records. I want to see how it's done over an appreciated you know, period of time. I know I talk to portfolio managers and analysts from different funds, and sometimes there's their new funds and they want to make a pitch and they say that, you know, we're going to do this, this, and that. And I say, well, I'm not going to invest in it because you don't have a track record. And sometimes they come back and say, but Rick, that's not fair. I say, who cares? I'm not being fair to the mutual fund or the investment is nothing. I want to be fair to investors. That's who I work for. Not fair to the investment itself because that is relatively immaterial. We don't have an emotional attachment to them. We want to make sure that we focus on, you know, the important things. That's why you look at track records. You see how something is done. You know, you see it with baseball teams. They're looking for someone who's performed well. They look at track records. We should too. Three, there are so many different types of investment vehicles out there. It's mind boggling. You know, there's mutual funds, there's stocks, there's ETFs, there's partnerships. There's all sorts of things to invest in. But there's something I always want people to understand, and that is you should never invest in anything that you don't understand. I see people invest in, um, I talked to someone the other day, they invested in this uh, annuity. So they asked me, do you think it was, uh, you know, uh, a good move, this or that? So I said, well, I, I don't know. I need to look at the contract. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I assume you read the contract. You know, you put a lot of money into this. You read the contract and understand the terms. He said, no, aren't they all the same? They're not. In every investment, you have to make sure you understand it. And at a minimum, you need to understand how you can make money, how you can lose money, and how you can get your money out when you want. If you don't understand those things about an investment, you shouldn't be in it. I mean, one of the reasons I don't invest in Bitcoins is because I don't understand them. I remember having a number of years ago, you know, a couple of Wall Street guys come in. They were talking about derivatives, you know, the whole bit. And at the end, they asked me and I said, no, nah, we wouldn't go there. I just don't understand them. And of course, they tried to make me look dumb. Like I care. I mean, I want to understand what I'm investing in, and I want to admit if I don't understand it, it's not something I should do because I don't understand the risk. Every investment you make, you should know how to make money, how you can lose money, and how you get your money out. And when in any investment, if you're dealing with an advisor, it's fair to ask those questions. And if anyone tells you you can't lose money, you ought to run. Because every investment, you know, has those issues. Four, I admit, I am tight with the buck. I love coupons. I love on sale. And my favorite word is free. I love that stuff. And I think a lot of people do too. We like saving money. We don't like spending unnecessarily. But when it comes to investments, people have no problem spending 
literally thousands of dollars a year in unnecessary fees. And the reason that is because they never look at the fees of an investment. Well, I never invest in anything until I know what it costs me, what it costs me to buy, what it costs me to sell, and what it costs me to hold. I want to know those things. And it is important because High fees equal low returns. I've always impressed upon investors, if you want to be successful, you must focus on the fees. It's not a coincidence that better performing investments, better performing mutual funds have lower fees. And fees these days come in all sorts of ways. Now, one of the things is, is commissions. And when it comes to commissions, let me explain what commissions are. Commissions come out of the money that you are investing. So if you invest in a, uh, a product, and let's say for easy math, it had 5% commissions. If you invested $10,000, they would take out $500. And then you'd have $9,500 left in the investment. So that is how commissions work. Now, like everything else in our world, there's hybrids. So commissions can also come out on a year-by-year -year basis. Some commissions you just pay up front. Some you pay over every year you're in the investment. And other commissions come if you sell before a certain time. They, they call those back-end loads. Now, in addition to the commissions, then investments like mutual funds have management fees. Every mutual fund has management fees, but not every mutual fund has commissions. You can invest commission-free today. And I recommend, you know, for as long as I have been involved in the investment world for more years than I want to admit, you should invest commission-free. Why pay commissions if you don't have to? And people, the reason why people don't ask costs about an, an investment, they're afraid to look cheap. They're embarrassed. Like, it's not professional to ask a guy in a suit and tie or whatever what the fees are. Well, I will suggest as a professional I can't think of anything more professional than talking about fees. I mean, if someone wants to have a professional relationship with you, why shouldn't you talk about fees? And I'll tell you this, when they don't want to talk about fees, then you know you're paying too high of fees. The other one that always gets me. Hey, Rick, we got a quick yeah. question. Sure. Um, someone wants to know, what is a commission fee invest? A commission fee? Invest. Well, I, uh, yeah. Okay, so like as an example, there's certain mutual funds that are commissioned. So you can pay upwards of eight and a half percent. And traditionally, you'll see those as what are called class A share funds. And that's what those are. Now, in other investment vehicles, like a limited partnership, there are commissions you have to read the prospectus. In things like an annuity, it's a little more difficult to find out the commissions because it's the way it comes out of your money. But if you read the prospectus, you can get a better idea. And I hope that answers the question. Now, still talking about fees is... Even in our personal life, don't we always want to save on fees? Don't we get, we hate being nickeled and dimed to death? Well, here in investments, you can make a real difference. Understand all costs. And if anyone doesn't want to tell you, you know you're paying too high a fee. And again, when it comes to the annuity, sometimes they tell you, oh, you're not paying me, the company is. Well. If the company's paying you, 
then that's where you're going to be loyal to. And that's one of the reasons I don't like commissions, because it creates a conflict of interest. Who are you loyal to? You're loyal to the person who paid you. If they're getting paid from the annuity company, that's who they're loyal to. And I'll tell you this about commissions. I've known over my career many commission salespeople. Some of them are great. They do what's best for their clients. They don't worry about commissions. Unfortunately, there's too many people in the commission world. They look at what commissions they are. That's why you get people sometimes locking money up in annuities for 15, 20 years. It's not for their benefit. It's for the benefit of the salesperson. And unfortunately, you know, when you deal on a commission basis, the question of, of them being independent. When you hire a professional, like you hire a doctor, you want them to be loyal to one person and one person only, and that is you. You don't want them loyal to the drug company. So it's important to understand costs so you can really know, um, you know, conflicts of interest and, and those type of things. My last rule is, and I always tell people when you have a nose my size, you know, you have to have a smell test. Well, when something smells too good to be true, it is. I mean, we have to be reasonable when it comes to investing money. I would love to tell you that you could drink, eat, you know, take this pill before you go to bed and eat all you want, never have to exercise, you lose all the weight you want. I mean, I'd love to tell you that. It's just not true. People can say anything about investing, about all sorts of stuff, and get away with it. Because the crooks today are coming from all over the world. When you do things on the internet, you have no idea where it's going. So when someone tells you, I have an investment that you can't lose money, run. If someone tells you, I have an investment that... You know, every year you double your money, every two years you double your money, run. I like the TV show American Greed. And when I've watched that show on CNBC, you see people fall for the same old tricks. Is that people either are afraid to miss out on something. And so they let their guard down and they get taken from all sorts of different people, people from their church, from their little, their kids' little league. You know, they belong to the same PTO and things of that nature. I mean, you have to be willing to protect yourself. And one of that is to be reasonable. Someone, if they overpromise, you know something isn't right. So those are the five rules I live by when it comes to investing. Now, before we get started, with investing, I think there's a few things you need to do. First, you need to set up an emergency fund of money. And the emergency fund of money is important. And this is a perfect example. You don't want to have to sell your investments when you don't want to. You know, if you look at it and said, I had to sell, I have to sell my investments, let's say by October 1st, you missed between the first and the end of the month, you could miss 10% increase. You don't let the market dictate to you, you let your goals and objectives dictate. So you don't want to have to sell into weakness when you don't want to. If you had an emergency fund of money that you can tap into, then you can cover most things. So what I recommend for people before they start investing, they first determine what it costs them to live a month. It's so important to know what it costs you to live a month. And I'm not talking just existing, the bare basics. I'm talking about how you live. And what I tell people is you need three to six months of that to keep that liquid. Someone who's very secure in their job and not living on the edge, Three, four months may be sufficient. On the other hand, someone whose job uh, may be questionable, someone who tends to spend a little more than they should, someone who wants to be a little more conservative should have six months. And with this money, you keep it invested short term. 
short-term CDs, money market accounts, and the return isn't very good on those things. But the focus is not the return. The focus is on the availability of that money, the liquidity of it. I look at that money as an insurance policy because by having that, you're never forced to generally have to sell your investments into weakness. So I like the idea of having an emergency fund. Now, too, with investors, you also need to look at your debt situation. And people that are in severe debt, you know, you have to make decisions of whether you pay off your debt or whether you invest your money. And sometimes there's a third alternative. Sometimes I tell people they should go into bankruptcy. And it's not that I recommend bankruptcy, but I think it is a tool that people should use if they need to. And I, and I know people look at it, well, isn't there a stigma? Isn't this? Isn't that? Well, in today's world, no. I think most people have forgotten that General Motors went through bankruptcy a few years ago. They used it as a tool to get a fresh start. And sometimes that's what individuals should do. So if you're in severe debt, that's a, an alternative. But if you just have a little more debt than you should, the question is, you know, what should you do with that debt? Well, I will tell you this. If you have charge card debt, it's a typical charge card, you're paying 18 to 20 and percent per year. To me, it's a slam dunk. Before you invest, pay that off. I can't think of any investment that gives me a guaranteed 18.5% after taxes. And that's what you're getting. So look at your debt. And if you have this charge card debt, 18.5% is what you're paying. And that debt's not tax deductible. You need to do something to take care of it and to start paying that down. And I'm telling you, you get it a momentum when it comes to starting to pay down debt. Because all of a sudden, you know, you see that that same payment you're making is really digging into the debt. So I would tell people, you know, charge card debt without question. Now, when it comes to mortgages, well, you know, I don't think you necessarily have to rush out and, and pay those off, especially if you've uh, financed over a year ago and you have three or 4% returns. I got no problem, you know, letting those go. But I'll tell you this. I talked to someone uh, a few weeks ago, and they had sold some investments, and they don't want to reinvest their money. And they had about $100,000 from the sale of this investment. And so um, they were going to turn around, buy CDs or something of that nature. I told them, why not pay your house off? And you know what? They Not only did they think it was a great idea, they couldn't believe how great they felt by paying their house off. So think about, you know, if you're long-term, no, but if you have money, excess cash, that you don't feel comfortable investing, you don't want to invest it, why not pay your house off? Because getting rid of debt is always important. Now, what we also need to do is to talk a little bit about our investment strategy. What do we do now? Now that we set up our emergency fund of money, well, again, it's based upon goals and objectives. And so when it comes to an investment strategy, you first have to look at the type of investments you want to use. Do you want to use stocks? You want to use bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, because that'll help narrow your search. I think for the majority of people, they ought to look at mutual funds. With mutual funds, and let me explain what a mutual fund is. You're buying a basket of investments. And so it could be an index like the S&P 500, and then you're buying that basket. 
On the other hand, it could be an actively managed fund that may be a long-term U.S. growth fund. So that manager is investing in 50 or 100 different stocks within that you know, long-term growth area. So with investing, you're not buying one stock, you're spreading it out over a variety of stocks. And if you go into what we call an active managed fund, you're getting professional management, which is nice. So I think, especially for a new investor, for most people, they ought to focus on mutual funds. And in making it easier, I would tell you to focus on commission-free funds. If you're doing it yourself, why pay a commission? It doesn't, it's not important. Money looks better in your pocket than it does anywhere else. And then when it comes, and this is the most important part of building the portfolio, is the allocation. Most people think the most important thing is what mutual fund or what stock you buy. It's not. It's your allocation. How much in stocks, how much in bonds. You need to build the proverbial pie chart and map it out what you want to have. If you're doing it on your own, there's a lot of tools on the internet, you know, Fidelity site, Vanguard, that'll help you build that portfolio. Hey, Rick, we got a question. Sure. Um, it says, why would you prefer mutual funds over ETFs that invest in a similar portfolio? Wouldn't the well, mutual fund fees outweigh the lower cost of the ETF? Well, and that's a great question. And, you know, a lot of people think on ETFs, they're not fees, but there are fees. And, and that's, you know, one of the things I think when you look at studies, you know, especially if you're going into commission free funds that have low costs, I take a look at some of the Vanguard funds, you're seeing that the costs are very competitive with uh, ETFs. Now, I'll give you this. The one downside of mutual funds is the way they're taxed. With mutual funds, you are taxed on what we call capital gain distribution. So your dividends are something else, but capital gain distributions are the profits the funds make throughout the year, and they distribute those to investors. Now, this year, those may be losses, so that would help investors, but you do pay tax on, on that money. However, basically, you're accelerating the tax. I don't have a problem with ETFs. Um, and I think a lot of people can be very successful in them. The, the problem is if I had to choose, you know, between one grouping, I think mutual funds gives me, you know, a broader diversity, you know, with active management and uh, indexing investments. But I don't have a problem with ETFs, especially look at, I think they've been a mature market over the last 10 years. They're not all the same. And some do have fees you got to be uh, uh, aware of. Um, and, and the type of investment vehicles I would tell people that you need to consider twice are things like variable annuities. Now, in some situations are fine, but there are also some real downsides about variable annuities when it comes to getting your money out, taxes, and uh, fees. So, you know, be careful about that. And also what you need to do you need to decide what type of an account you're going to use. And this comes to taxes. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about taxes. And I know people will think I'm crazy. Your goal is not to lower your taxes. Think about that. And I said it correctly. Your goal is not to lower your taxes. Your goal is to have more money in your pocket. And if I was live, I would ask everyone who wants to lower their taxes to raise their hand. And a good number of people would raise their hand. I would pick on someone. And I would say, explain to me why you wouldn't have won, wanted to win the lottery that just happened where someone's going to win a billion dollars. Why wouldn't you want to win that? And of course, the person would say, well, of course, I'd want to win it. And I said, no, no, you want to lower your taxes as your main goal. 
So if you win that lottery, you're going to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. So I told him, if he's the winner, give me the lottery ticket. I'd be more than happy to pay a couple hundred million dollars in taxes because I would focus on the 300 million that ends up in my pocket. So many people are scammed because people tell you they can lower your taxes. And let me tell you this, it's easy to lower your taxes. I mean, and I have a foolproof way, and it's not going to get you arrested or anything of that nature. When you go to work tomorrow, ask your boss to cut your pay in half. It will lower your taxes. Well, of course, no one's going to do that. Because in reality, we know to focus on what ends up in our pockets. Why don't we do that when it comes to investing? I know what people, this is the other one that fools people. Well, this is what the wealthy do, what the real rich people do. Well, we all know that, you know, you get up into the tax code, there's things that are set up just for the very wealthy that they can only take advantage of, you and I can't. I mean, that's the way it is. Don't worry what they're doing because there are gimmicks they could use that you and I can't. That's just the reality. So when it comes to taxes, remember, your goal is to have more money in your pocket. Lowering your taxes does not necessarily mean more money. If you wanted to lower your taxes, you wouldn't have wanted to win that lottery. Now, in today's world, we have something now called, you know, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks. And that really affects people that are, you know, in the workforce today, you know, mostly. Well, the difference is, is that Roth IRAs, they grow tax-free. You never pay taxes on when you withdraw the money in a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. On the other hand, in a traditional IRA or a traditional 401k, when you withdraw the money, that's when you pay the tax. It's tax you at your ordinary income bracket. Now people are saying, well, if that's the case, why wouldn't I just go into Roth? Because there's one other issue. When you go into a Roth, you're putting in post-tax money. When you go into a traditional 401k or IRA, you're putting in pre-tax money. So if you put $5,000 in a traditional IRA, for most people that qualify, you could then write off $5,000 off your taxes. You know, it, it comes off your adjusted gross income. On the other hand, if you put money into a traditional 401k, if you made $50,000 a year and you put $5,000 into the 401k, it means you're only taxed on $45,000. On the other hand, if you're in a Roth 401k, if you make the $50,000 and you put $5,000 in the Roth, you're taxed on the $50,000. So you're paying, you're taking a short-term hit for a long-term gain. And I would tell you, for people that can invest long-term, I love the idea of having the Roth because it gives you the opportunity to let money grow tax-free. And it also has another benefit. When you were now 72 years of age, you have to take money out of your 401k and your IRAs, except your Roth IRA. You can let your Roth IRA grow tax-free for as long as you choose. In addition, if you pass away and you have a Roth IRA, your beneficiaries inherit that income tax-free. If you passed away and had a traditional IRA, 
your beneficiary beneficiaries inherit that money, but they're going to pay the taxes on it. So when it comes down to, you know, traditional 401k versus Roth 401k, I always tell people it's a time frame. Now, if someone was in a uh, low tax bracket, I'm definitely telling them to go into the Roth because there'll be very little cost and you get some huge benefits into the future. But everyone needs to consider it. I generally recommend, you know, when I dealt with, you know, young people that are just starting their work career, I tell them to go into the Roth 401k. I want to take the hit today to have a significant benefit 40 years down the road. Now, I want to make sure we leave some time to make sure that we get to, um, if you have any questions or things of that nature, feel free to uh, put them into the uh, chat room. And I do want to touch base on, on a couple things when it, it comes to investing and it comes to your overall financial situation, because it's important that you take an interest. You cannot afford to put your financial affairs today on automatic pilot. We live in a world that is constantly changing. And you have to be involved somewhat in the process. And some of the things that I mentioned this earlier that everyone needs to do is to make sure that they know what it costs them to live a month especially in these high inflationary times where our costs are going up, you need to monitor your expenses. It's the only way that you are going to be able to get through the inflation. And again, when I ask the majority of people what it costs you to live a month, people have no idea. You know, they think and they say, well, I don't know. If I ask them what their cholesterol number is, they know it, but they don't know what it costs them to live. And what I think it's important to do is for everyone to start keeping track of your expenses. It's easy to know what's coming in every month. That's your guide. Track it. If you're bringing in $5,000 a month from your pension, from Social Security, whatever, you ought to be able to know where that 5000 is going. And you can't just say charge card. You ought to break it down. Because one thing I see when people get involved with following their expenses, it gets to be a momentum and they want to cut back. So all of a sudden they see that they have a streaming service that they really don't need. They save $30, $40 a month. This is the time period to really look at your expenses and to make sure that you're more efficient with your money. Now, I know one of the questions that I get asked a lot, is people ask me, Rick, when, the stock, when is the stock market going to turn around? I don't know. I really have no idea and, no, and neither does anyone else. You can make predictions the whole bit. You know, it, it, it's a fool's game. What I do know is that 100% of the time the market has recovered, and I believe that this will recover too, and it's the patience. Whether it recover, you know, midway through next year or next year, it, it really, it's a fool's game. We're on a journey, and we want to look at that journey. We're going to have some rough spots, but we want to focus on the overall journey. And I would analogize to, you know, going to law school. So when I went to law school, if you would have asked me after the first couple of weeks of law school, what do I think? And I would say, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. I can't believe, you know, the professors are telling us how dumb we are, and this and that. So if I would have judged my investment of quitting my job and going to law school, it wasn't so good. If you look years down the road, it was probably the best thing I've ever done. So don't let, you know, short-term speed bumps 
detract you from achieving your long-term goals. Because what people do is for short-term comfort, they cause long-term pain. You don't want to do that. Now, when people say to me, Rick, is this a good time to invest? It's a great time to invest if your goals are long-term. Because I would tell you, think about this. When do you go shopping? I go shopping when things are on sale. That's when I want to buy things. Well, the stock market is on sale. Now, may the stock market go lower? It may. I don't really know over the short run what can happen. But, you know, you don't look at timing. It's like if you go to a store and something's on sale for 50%, you say to yourself, well, do I come back in another couple of weeks because it's going to be 60% off? Well, that may, product may not be available. Sometimes you have to look at it. Is this a fair price? Not focus on the short term. Look at the long term. So from a standpoint of a long term investor, this is a great time to invest and you shouldn't be afraid to do it. Now, let me add this. Let me tell you what will make you a much better investor. And that's to learn about investing. You know, they talked earlier about some of the resources at the library online. You know, before you jump in, if you've never invested before, don't hesitate to learn about investing. And I will tell you, it's a lifelong journey. I have to constantly update my skills to stay current because everything is changing. And so it's a long-term journey that you're on, but the more you know, knowledge is power. Let me tell you this, those people in the investment world are not geniuses. What they try to do somewhat, and I see this all the time in the conferences I attend, they try to talk in big words and, you know, they show their charts and screens and try to confuse you. Don't fall for that. You don't need to. Keep it simple. Focus on your goals and objectives. Focus on the risk you're willing to take. You're going to be successful as an investor. And again, Set your parameters first, your goals and objectives, and that proverbial pie chart so you know what you're going to invest in. So then you start looking for the investments. And again, I would tell you, I'd focus on, you know, no commission mutual funds. You can get them through Vanguard. You can go to Fidelity, go to Schwab. You can do all sorts of, you know, research, but that'll help you narrow your research. And I also tell you one last thing, being involved with your money, it's actually fun. It's the only hobby I know of that you can actually make money as opposed to costing you money. So be involved with your money. So on that note, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I want to see if there's any other questions. And, and again, to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, be here on this beautiful evening. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? You can drop them in the chat. Actually, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'll read the, oh, yep, we got a few. I'll ask our questions first. Okay, how do you feel about investing in metals like gold or silver? Well, traditionally, I'm not a gold or silver metal investor. I, I think that if someone wanted to have like a 5%, portion of their portfolio, I wouldn't have a, a problem with it. But you got to really, there's different ways to invest in the metals. You can buy the metals themselves. And if you're buying a lot of it, then you're going to have to pay storage fees and, and those type of things. But as a commodity, you know, I'm not thrilled as an investment, but as a hedge, if you wanted to keep like a 5% allocation, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Okay, uh, the next oh, let me just say this. Can I just add this? Yeah. And don't necessarily believe celebrity spokespeople on TV. 
I mean, just because they say, I buy my silver and gold at this, you know, don't fall for that. Do your research independently, because if you're particularly buying the silver or, or gold, you know, there's different fees involved by shopping around, at least going to get a better fee for yourself. Okay, the next question is, what do you think of Goldman Sachs? Well, Goldman Sachs is a huge company. So they have very, uh, you know, different arms. I would tell you this on the whole, they have some very, very smart people at Goldman Sachs. But Goldman Sachs, some of their mutual funds and some of their investments struggle just like anyone else. Um, and so I would treat them no different than any other investment house with any other investment. Yes, they have a great reputation, but that doesn't mean all their products are good. And so you still have to do your independent research if you're buying one of their, you know, investment products. You know, think about, you know, different companies that we buy products from. Some of the products are really good. Some aren't so good. And it's the same thing with uh, Goldman Sachs. And I would tell you, they're high end. You know, they have some very, very uh, smart people. I got another question over here. Uh, where do you think interest rates are headed in the next six months? I would say that uh, if I was a betting man, I would say they're going to be higher. Um, I, I think that the, the Federal Reserve controls interest rates is going to be uh, focusing on inflation. Inflation doesn't appear to be, you know, coming down. I think that we're going to see when the Federal Reserve meets uh, in November, I think we'll see another increase. It, but I, I think that sometime midway in uh, 2023, that you're going to see interest rates start pausing. So I think, you know, we're talking first half of 2023, I think we'll see higher interest rates. But then I see a pause as the economy starts slowing down and inflation really starts coming under control. Because I would tell you, from an investment standpoint, that's one of the keys, inflation coming down. High inflation is not good for anyone. And that's what the number one job of the Federal Reserve is to control inflation. Okay, I got another question. Um, what is your perspective on the dollar value over the next, say, 10 years? holding value, or should we invest in other currency, not Bitcoin? Well, yeah, I would invest in Bitcoin. I mean, the dollar is high right now. It, and uh, um, I think, and you talk to a lot of people, it's too high. So 10 years is hard to say because who knows how many administrations we're going to have over the next 10 years. So I prefer to say over the short term, I think the dollar is going to remain high. And then I would, hope, would think a year or so now from now, you're going to see the dollar start declining. How far it declines, I don't know. The problem with currency, it is so volatile and, and so many things can uh, uh, affect it. Um, that's one thing I don't get involved in is currency trading because I don't understand all the risks with all the other different currencies. Um, and as an investor, I follow my own rules. But I would tell you the dollar is very high now. It hurts us as a country with exports and and uh, things of that nature. But I think with high inflation, it's going to be with us for a while. Okay. And I have a follow-up to that one. Person says, uh, so should I hold back on investing until 2023, considering the interest rates? I may get a better return on my investment if I wait, question mark. Are, are you talking about currency? On a currency trade, probably. Now, if you're talking about a stock market trade, no. I, I I mean, you know, I would tell you that markets are down, and I don't know, they may drop a little further, but you can't time the market. You know, markets are, are you know, fairly priced right now. So if someone was long-term and they said, is this a good time? It is. Now, let me warn you about one thing. And, when, and it goes back to the question about mutual funds versus ETFs. Now, it may not be a problem this year, but you really need to check it. With mutual funds, they make what is known as capital gain distributions. Those are the profits the fund has made throughout the year. Uh, they get distributed. Now, last year was a bad year. There were a lot of gains distributed. 
This year, there are probably not going to be many. There may be losses. So, but, but before you invest in a mutual fund this time of year, generally, it's hard to believe we're already in November, but you want to find out from the fund company what their capital gain distribution is and when it's going to be distributed. Now, if it's an IRA, it doesn't matter because the the tax consequences. But if you're buying it individually, you want to uh, you know check that out. But as a someone investing like in an individual stock, yeah, this is a, a very good time with the market being on sale. And again, you look over the last month, the markets were up over ten percent. And that was in one month. Anything, you know, can happen over short periods of time. No one thought in 2020, when the market was down 25% in March and the economy was being shut down, that by the end of the year, the stock market would have rallied and had a very good year. So markets are going to recover, generally do recover faster than the economy. Okay. Um, oh, we have a thank you. <laughs> well, thank um, you. <laughs> I have a question for you. So I read a lot of these money diaries that are online, and I I don't understand the purpose or or what you would uh, put money in a high yield savings account for. Like, is that for when you just want to try to make money on the short term, but you still need it like readily well, available? So let's say, um, and, and again, there's different high yield savings accounts. So let me tell you this about savings accounts. I don't care what they call it. You ought to make sure it's FDIC insured. Um, There's some, you know, these high yield savings accounts that they're actually banks in, you know, the Caribbean. And you don't want those too much risk. So you want to only invest in whether money markets, high yield that are FDIC insured, which means your money is protected. So a lot of times, so let's say I sold my house and My new house isn't ready and I have, you know, I'm going to live somewhere for three, four months and then I'm going to close on my new house. I don't want to take any market risk with that money, but I want to earn something on it. So sometimes I can go into a little, you know, savings account and get higher rates of return than I can in a money market. So that that's really what it it, it comes down to. Now, I would tell you there's a good website. It's called bankrate.com. And people can shop around savings accounts. All the institutions they have are FDIC insured, which means they're federally insured. And you'd be surprised that you get different rates by shopping around. And sometimes you see a bank and you say, wow, they're so much higher than anyone else. It must be a gimmick. No, they're trying to buy business. You know, it's kind of like sometimes you go to a grocery store and milk is cheaper. So, of course, you got to trot to the, the end of the store to get the milk, but stores sell it differently. And sometimes there's lost leaders to get people in the store. Well, especially a lot of Internet banks, they want to get people to use them so they give higher rates on certain things. Why not take advantage of it? It's federally insured. If you can make a few extra dollars, my philosophy, the money always looks better in your pocket than it does anyone else's. Right. Okay. And so I have two more questions here. Um, Ruben would like to know, do you offer other kinds of investment classes? Well, we do a variety of ones, you know, um, you know, through the libraries. And I would tell you to visit our website, you know, um, we have, you know, different ones that we offer. Um, so, yeah, I, I try to get, I give a number of speeches throughout the years and I, dedicate myself to making them educational because I honestly believe money looks better in your pocket than it does anywhere else. And, you know, think about this. We live in the greatest, richest country in the history of the world. There's not a country in second place, but they never teach us about money. And, you know, that's what's troubling. So I want to, you know, do educational stuff so people can make better decisions with their money. And we do have two more uh, Bloom programs coming up in January. Um, You can check our calendar online for it because I can't remember the exact date. One of them is getting off to a good financial start in 2023. And the other one is uh, about planning for your retirement and estate when you're single, whether you're divorced, single, widowed, 
um, is planning for that kind of thing. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm amazed it's 2023. I mean, where I did the too. years go? I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. That's crazy. And I've got one more question from Todd. Um, any suggestions for a cash account with a half decent interest rate beyond yeah, CDs I, or high yield savings accounts or I bonds? Well, the problem with I bonds is, you know, they're harder to buy and not as liquid, um, especially for the short term. I would tell you, I would go to that bankrate.com and, uh, you know, I don't want to take risk with short term money. Um and, you know, again, I only want to invest in something that's for the short term, that's FDIC insured. Um, you know, some of these, you know, the high yield, you know, like bonds and, and, and things of that nature. Um, you're going to get higher returns, but you're taking a greater risk. And I think for short periods of time, it's really not worth the risk. And what happens is those high yields, if interest rates go up, you can find that there's a temporary downturn in your money, especially when you need it. And so those periods of time, I want to shop around. And, and again, I would look at if, if you can lock it up for six months, look at for some six month CDs or money market accounts. I would use that bankrate.com, but only FDIC insured. Um, it, it's just so important that you protect your money. Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much, Rick. We really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. <laughs> well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I, I always feel I'm the lucky one that I get to talk to you about investing. I want to encourage everyone to be involved with their money, uh, take interest because, you know, and, and don't think you're going to be an expert overnight. You're not. But the more interest you take, you'd be surprised how successful you are. And, you know, don't think everyone's smarter than you, because I'm telling you, they're not. I've been with the Wall Street people. Trust me, they're not. You can do it. Ask questions. And don't let anyone intimidate you. So on that note, um, thanks so much for having me. And I hope since it's November, it's not too early to wish everyone a very happy uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, well, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who are attending, thank you for attending. Um, you should have had a survey that popped up on your screen as soon as you um, logged on. And if you would like to give us any of your comments or suggestions, we appreciate it. Thank you so much.